Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, if you're in India. Uh, good morning, good evening, if you're in some other part of the world uh, watching today's session. Uh, this session is around geospatial data. We're going to talk about governance, policy, technology, and, and a whole lot around the geospatial ecosystem. Uh, my name is Ravi Chander. I'm the moderator for the session. And as you will see as the session progresses, the person least qualified to be talking about geospatial data and the like. Uh, we have an extremely interesting uh, set of speakers and panelists, and I will come to them as it's their turn to speak. Now, during the course of this session, you have a chance to ask your questions or make your comments in the chat box on your Keystone platform. And later on in the discussion, uh, we panelists will have a chance to address those questions. We will start today's session with our keynote speaker. And before I go to him, I just want to give you a sense of what we are going to try and achieve over the next two hours. In the area of geospatial data governance policy and the rest, we are going to try and get a sense of where we are currently in the geospatial space. How did we get here? What's been our journey to get where we are today? Then we will talk in terms of where do we wish to get to in geospatial uh, ecosystem? And what are the possible pathways to get to that desired end stage? So essentially three aspects to it. Where are we right now? Where do we wish to go? And how do we get there? It's going to have, while there will be talk about challenges and the like, the focus is going to be in terms of a solutioning focus in terms of how do we overcome any challenges and get to what we want. Our first keynote speaker is Dr. Vijay Raghavan, who is the principal scientific advisor for the government of India. Dr. Vijay Raghavan is a Padma Shri and a distinguished professor in the field of developmental genetics and the former director of NCBS Bangalore He's been is part of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, fellow of Royal Society, and a whole lot more. The thing I found most interesting in his bio is he has a new species of gecko, which was named after him. And if I've got the pronunciation right, it is called Hemidactylus Vijay Raghavani. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Dr. Vijay Raghavan. Over to you, Dr. Vijay Raghavan. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ravi Chandar. It's a great uh, pleasure and an honor to be here. Um, this is a very important area which you have uh, under discussion and the panelists are very qualified. Um, and I'm sure this will be a very interesting panel discussion and I look forward to listening uh, to that. Uh, my brief intervention will add one point and focus on that point to the points you added. Uh, Dr. Ravi Chandra said, you know, we wanted to know where we are, where we want to go, and how do we go to where we want to go. I would add one more point to that uh, as the focus of my intervention, and that's about how did we come here. And how did we come here is important because if you look at, you know, what topics we want to include in the panel discussion, they are uh, the mapping industry, the current challenges and roadblocks, the data gaps, the role of institutions and organizations in special data policy, implications of new policy guidelines, and the expectations of the geo community. All of these are very, very important. And they will unlock the system going forward. But together with this, we need to understand what are the high level problems we need to solve today, in addition to the more immediate economic and social issues with improved mapping can address. And those high level problems can be summarized in three words, climate, energy, and environment. If these three issues are not addressed, then you know all our economic and other aspects are for naught. So to address these three issues, we need to know where, how we came here. And there are two important points in understanding where we came here in the context of these three words, climate, energy, and environment. 
first of all how did we as a species come to dominate the earth right so that point i'll summarize very briefly then point out how we as a species have changed the earth in a manner where we are now responsible for its future and the third point how information knowledge and decision making synthesized from knowledge is going to be critically important going forward so the first point how did we as a species come about uh, that is extraordinary and that extraordinary low probability event is um you know clearly stated in the theory of evolution by natural selection which Charles Darwin and Alfred Russel Wallace clearly propounded and basically this allows the selection of those who are fit in a certain environment but in this process they are all linked by a common thread of life all life on earth is linked it has a common origin and there's a common thread and that common thread is you know metaphorically dna and therefore the metabolic processes in the lowliest of single cellular organisms and the largest of dinosaurs or whales is very very has very many common features so that commonality is important but during this evolution of this range of animals in between something rather remarkable happened and that those three things with respect to humans not only transformed us and made us special but made us have the opportunity to transform the planet and those three things are simply stated we had the ability unlike our other primate cousins to oppose thumb and four finger this allows you as a teacher to throw a chalk at a student who is sleeping but also make tools make instruments of various kinds and shape the planet around us so this ability to grasp objects and you know use them in a variety of ways is you know may not be unique but close to being unique the second dramatic evolutionary change was our ability to voice sounds in a manner where language could evolve that range of frequency of amplitude modulation the changes in our voice box and the corresponding changes in our brain were extraordinary this was a very important component this and the previous one in our ability to change the planet but a third dramatic change happened and that came about it's not clear how but was selected for in a manner distinct from what happened in our other non human primate in our cousins chimpanzees gorillas and so on in those animals the size of the brain is proportionate to their body in a certain ratio in us our brain and particularly some as some parts of our brain is disproportionately large right this disproportionately large brain requires huge amounts of energy even for the size of the brain our non human primate cousins have they must eat pretty much constant but we don't need to eat constant yet we have a much larger brain how is that we seem to have learned the ability to pack high calorific content into meals by being able to cook food in a manner which other animals can so these three dramatic changes maybe cooking is not the only reason for a large brain but could be a factor these three have made us different and these three have made us different so much that we have tools we have language and we have because of our brain unusually unusually an extraordinary power of abstraction consciousness which perhaps no other animal has and we have become from being merely products of evolution on this canvas of this planet and as other philosophers have pointed out we now wield the paint brush which determines the future of this canvas of this planet so we are now the stewards of this planet so this is how we came about so there's an extraordinary you know responsibility now that responsibility has been 
you know, used in manners which are, again, quite, you know, unimaginable, uh, even to humans, more than 10,000 years ago. About 10,000 years ago, we started domesticating plants and animals. And as this progress, as this progressed, there was clearly a limitation on the expansion of human civilization and human population because land was running out of its capacity to feed human population. Humans then invented ways by which through manure and by fertilizer, which was then guano and later on the night mines could re-energize the soil and allow agriculture products, animal feed, everything to come up. Even so, there were limitations. In the early 20th century, two scientists, Haber and Bosch, invented the Haber-Bosch process to grasp ammonia from the hydrogen from the atmosphere, uh, nitrogen from the atmosphere, and make ammonia. And this ability to take nitrogen and make ammonia, and from then make ammonical fertilizers allowed an unlimited expansion of agriculture. It also sadly allowed the creation of weapons of mass destruction, chemical weapons, but that's another story. But the availability of fertilizer meant that agriculture no longer had limitations and populations grew enormous. Then we had the industrial revolutions, the first, second, third, and fourth industrial revolutions. And if there's one common theme which runs across these revolutions, it's a simple one. It's the self-confidence of humans, of elites and those in power in particular, but of humans in general, to feel that their role is to rule over nature, right? There are many civilizational themes which talk about living with nature and interacting with that and so on. Uh, these themes in, you know, Indian cultures and civilization in, you know, um, South American ones and so on. There are many such. But those were not the themes of the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution's themes were, if there's a problem, we can fix it. If we're running out of copper, we'll find a way. If communication has to be done in some other manner, we'll find a way. If cities, you know, need to be packed with more people, we'll find a way. If we need more water, we fix it. If we need more energy, we can fix it. This confidence came about because of the successes of science and technology applied through economics and politics and governance and so on all over the world. But there's also a fundamental law of physics, which such an approach tends to forget. And that law is a simple one. If you want order and prosperity and wealth in a particular location, i.e. you want to reduce entropy as a point, reduce chaos, then this comes at a cost. And that cost must be at a cost of natural resources, as at a cost of energy, at a cost of exploitative markets, of explo exploiting other people and so on. In other words, if you want your house to be rich and well organized and clean, it came at a cost of other people's houses not being so. But today's world has come into a different context altogether. People all over the world have been empowered, and no one wants to be at the receiving edge of giving work to others for which they will be more ordered and you will be in trouble. More fundamentally, the consequences of climate change, environmental de uh, devastation, and a lack of sustainable living for many has created a groundswell of a view that sustainable development for all is a goal. And that requires that development take place without exploiting the environment and without exploiting other people or your own people. And this poses an enormous challenge in multiple social cultural ways, but also in the way of thermodynamics. How do you have order without consequent disorder elsewhere, in a, all over the planet? Now, fortunately, there are some solutions or near solutions to this. 
availability of renewable energy of various kinds and the availability of communication technologies and the availability of ways by which power can be used, better transmission chains of various kinds, means that we can be much more energy efficient and environmental friendly in whatever we do. So that's the plan. Now, what is all this aligned by saying? What is all this got to do with data? Right? Where is data coming? The fact of the matter is that we have a planet now of several billion humans. Today, humans and our livestock constitute 98% of vertebrate biomass, right? 10,000 years ago, humans and our livestock and our pets constituted less than 1% of vertebrate biomass. So we, we dominate the planet. So we are generating data of all kinds, both you know, what we're seeing, climate, weather, transportation, health, agriculture, floods, you know, the way rivers flow, where glaciers melt and everything. But we're making a very serious mistake. We can use all this data relatively easily in immediate commercial activities. There's no doubt about it. But we remember, we must remember, the data needs to have two major sets of components. The first one, those who have data have power and that power results in an asymmetric world. And therefore access to data and its fruits must be democratized. Otherwise you will have a great asymmetry. Historically, knowledge has been power and the current tendency that data is essential for knowledge means that there will be a great asymmetry in the uh, exercising of power which comes to data. And that must change by us having access to data and its consequences on a more democratic. So that's teaching and training in the use of data in one's own language and having applications which allow us to do that, empower us to be owners of data rather than those to whom data and its consequences Upper way, yeah. The second aspect is about data itself. No matter who owns it, you must remember that information needs to be annotated. Data needs to be taken up in a manner where it's annotated. Information needs to go to knowledge. Knowledge needs to go to understanding, and the understanding has to go into reasoning, into multiple parameters and decision making. Now, this is, cannot be done by apps alone. This cannot be done by APIs and putting layers and giving that information. Ultimately, we need to have mechanisms where the ability to understand, grasp complexities of data across multiple domains and take a decision needs to be done. Humans have done this over a historical period with ease. You go in with a Bayesian prior. Humans have a viewpoint. And they say, this is the way the world is. And they're prepared to change their views depending on what consequences that view has, right? And that's a relatively slow process. Today, the vagaries, the challenges of climate change, energy, and the environment require us to take decisions very rapidly, not on a time scale which we are used to do. And that requires an ability to integrate the analysis of data and understanding and its use at multiple levels. This is a huge challenge. I'd like to end by saying that in governments, in politics, we need to take decisions by the weekend or in two weeks. That's the time scale we're talking about taking decisions, right? It's very easy for those who are outside to say, why did you do this and why didn't you do that? But those in government have to take a decision fast and the availability of data is critically important. And having taken that data, and the decision, you cannot change your view the next week. You have to find ways of dealing with the consequences of every decision. This is about governance and politics. Industry wants to see profits in each quarter, right? It doesn't want to say, ah, I'll do this and I'll see profits five years, 10 years later, right? Industry wants to see profits in a quarter. And scientists and technologies want to give solutions in a decadic time. So there are huge asymmetries in core capabilities and desires of these three sections. So data must have also the ability 
to cross connect these three you know, speeds over uh, you know, these three different sectors and result in a way by which material and ideas can flow between these three different speeds of movement and allow decision making to be taken really well in all three and benefits coming from science and technology come at a very rapid pace. Thank you very much. Uh, thank, thank you, Dr. Vijay Raghavan, for that. I mean, uh, been very, very enlightening. You know, for I, I was just reminded as I heard your earlier bit about the species. Uh, for those of you, I think, who haven't read this book, there's a book, Indica, by Pranay Lal, which gives a sense of the natural history of the Indian subcontinent. Uh, it does delve into some of the things that Dr. Vijay Raghavan alluded to. Uh, for me, there were two, three takeaways, and then when we come to the panel discussion, I would like to ask a few more related to geospatial policy per se, which we haven't discussed. But for me, the takeaway really was that we are the stewards and custodians, and the elite have a responsibility in terms of what they do with all the large data and the information. I think that was an extremely important point as we go forward in the panel discussion. And you mentioned about information, knowledge, understanding. I think of it in terms of the four eyes. So you get information, you derive insights from the information, then you generate ideas from this information and insights, and you take it to implementation. And as Dr. Vijay Raghavan aptly pointed out, in the current age, speed of action is extremely important. And while industry wants it at super speed because there are profits and other issues involved, academia and scientists may move at a more slowing glacial, of course the glaciers are no longer slowly um, uh, dissolving, it's dissolving much faster, but they are willing to wait a little longer. So how do we marry uh, in terms of government, industry, academia, and we'll have issues to discuss this. I next call upon uh, the two WRI veterans uh, Bina Shetty and Raj Bhagat, uh, they will give us a sense about the subject that we are talking about today. And I think Bina and Raj will also walk us through certain case studies and applications where they have had occasion to use the geospatial data. Uh, over to you, Bina. Thank you so much, Ravi. And uh, thank you, Dr. Raghavan, for uh, the insightful keynote uh, uh, address, you know, uh, uh, very eloquently laid out the context for this session. Um, you know, uh, as you mentioned with our recent technological advances, capturing spatial information, you know, has now become possible and ensuring that this data is made available to a wider platform is uh, definitely a step in the right direction. Um, and our hope is that this, you know, progressive move triggers innovations in the space, uh, makes governance and policy making, especially in the sectors that you highlighted, uh, climate, energy, and environment, uh, much more data-driven. Uh, so with that, let me uh, share my screen. All right. So as you can see, um, we have a very uh, impressive panel lined up here today and you know, I really can't wait to get the conversation started. Um, huge thank you for all of you to taking, uh, for taking the time out uh, for being here. Um, I'm also thrilled uh, to have uh, Ravi Chandar moderating the session. I think with all of the experience that you bring to the table, uh, I'm sure we'll have a very engaging uh, conversation. Uh, so before we jump into this discussion, you know, I'd like to take a bit of uh, time and showcase some of our work in WRI India. Uh, if you've attended some of our uh, sessions this week, you know, there have been many conversations around how data plays a key role in uh, the urban development space. Uh, you've uh, heard multiple occasions, you know, um, our data community often complain about lack of good, clean data. Uh, but what do we really do with this data? You know, a lot of times I, I've seen a huge gap in understanding how data fits into this space. So uh, my intent, you know, with this uh, presentation is really to showcase how research organizations such as ours uh, rely on multiple diverse geospatial data sets for our uh, strategic planning projects. Uh, you know, so we have access to technology to create advanced models. Um, we have the skills, we have the expertise, and oftentimes it's uh, access to data that ends up being our biggest challenge. And a little bit about ourselves. Uh, we are part of the Sustainable Cities Program. 
uh, we focus on key deep dive cities in India, working with uh, local government agencies uh, and uh, city agencies, and we tackle uh, key urbanization challenges, such as congestion, pollution, climate change. And, uh, you know, with the help of map and visuals, our real aim is to initiate local uh, discourse and a policy dialogue. Uh, and as I've said before, you know, we rely on a variety of data sets. So we leverage census data for vulnerability assessments, weather data from IMD for statistical uh, modeling, DEMs or digital elevation data to build flood risk models. So I'll be showcasing some of this work where we've used, you know, all of these data sets in the next section. Uh, in our toolkit, we uh, extensively use Google Earth Engine and Python uh, for classifying satellite imagery um, to track temporal changes in our built up and green cover. And we're currently working uh, with multiple stakeholders on national, state and city led projects across India. Uh, so in Delhi, you know, we're partnering with the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs on uh, projects related to the economic geography of the region. Uh, in Telangana, we're partnering with uh, TSIC, the Innovation Cell, to explore the impacts of a regional pharma economy. Bangalore, we're working with uh, BMRCL to support on integrated transport uh, planning. Uh, Mumbai, we're providing technical support to MCGM uh, in drafting the city's climate action plan, you know, by conducting vulnerability assessments, building flood risk models, and uh, estimating GHG inventories for the city. And, uh, you know, apart from all of this, there are also multiple uh, research projects currently underway across, you know, cities span India. So, you know, the big question that we try to solve every day, uh, how do we make our cities more resilient, inclusive, and competitive with the help of data? Uh, now, according to UN projections, you know, by 2050, seven out of 10 people in the world will live in urban spaces. Uh, and for India, this translates to almost 80 crore people um, living in, uh, you know, our urban cities. Uh, that's nearly double of where we are right now. So uh, if you think about, you know, the city that you live in, what changes, uh, you know, would your city need to make in the next 30 years to accommodate and adapt to this growing pressures on our resources and services? Uh, so in, to ensure sustainable and equitable growth uh, with data, what we try to do is understand the needs of these growing cities and we evaluate opportunities for improved resource usage. So the, under the Amrit scheme, we're currently working on area development strategies. So uh, we're looking at local area plans. We were redesigning city cores. We're looking at town planning schemes. Uh, we were looking at uh, expansions along the peripheries. And here we are, what we're really doing is incorporating multiple GIS layers, including build form, uh, land ownership, and we evaluate the feasibility of these projects to balance the social, economic, and environmental considerations at the local level. Uh, with the recent pandemic, uh, you know, there's been a huge uh, push and drive to promote and incentivize our domestic uh, uh, pharmaceutical ecosystem. Uh, so as part of a feasibility analysis of a pharma cluster in Telangana, we've specialized the economic activity and infrastructure to assess the competitiveness of the proposed cluster. So, you know, here we're looking at the spatial distribution of the pharma industry. We're looking at uh, locations of testing labs, cold chains, research institutes, and we're assessing the proximity to essential infrastructure. So in terms of logistics, you know, do we have access to ports, major highways, are there gaps in our transport freight corridors, and all of the essential infrastructure that's relevant to uh, the pharma biomedical industry. NCR, we're looking at the economic geography and spatial spread of industries from the city center and along metro corridors. And a lot of time and effort was spent here in, uh, you know, spatializing the available economic census data. Um, so, you know, the intent here is to understand the evolution of uh, industry clusters, identify key economic drivers and project future growth. Uh, this allows us to really assess, you know, where we are right now and where we need to be um, to get closer to the government's ambitious uh, $5 trillion GDP target. Bangalore, we're looking at transit-oriented development projects. Um, this is a proven planning strategy, you know, which concentrates jobs, services, housing around public uh, transport. Uh, and, you know, uh, this makes cities more productive while reducing our carbon footprint. So here, uh, what we're doing is evaluating the current land use, assessing the consumed FARs and the potential impact and opportunities of uh, enhancing these FARs to facilitate improved utilization of spaces around our uh, public transport. 
uh, resource optimization is also a critical piece, you know, where we evaluate our current service gaps in our networks. Uh, so these are service accessibility maps that we create, which uh, are a great way to highlight existing connectivity gaps and lack of services to vulnerable sections of the society, you know, specifically those sections that rely on these modes of transport. Uh, in some of our past sessions, you know, this week, uh, there was talk of building these uh, 15 minute neighborhoods within our city spaces, you know, so it's an urban residential concept where most of our citizens can meet their needs by a short walk or a, a cycle ride. And uh, essentially the idea here is to ensure equitable access to those who do not own cars and reduce the reliance on transport. So here we're looking at gaps in our networks, you know, that don't meet service level benchmarks that are defined for access to amenities such as schools, uh, open spaces, hospitals, you know, are these public spaces easily and safely accessible by our vulnerable populations, you know, the children, youth, can we bring in the gender lens into our planning here? Do we have sufficient access to toilets? Can we have more lit streets to make these many cities more vibrant and safer? Uh, we're also looking at capacity assessments, you know, so can we optimize the location of our healthcare facilities to ensure adequate number of beds per capita across all of our wards, you know, all of these things become crucial in improving the quality of life in our cities. Uh, here we're looking at overlaps in services between our uh, bus networks and metro corridors in Bangalore. And uh, we're crunching large gigabytes of data sets here. So we're looking at, you know, GPS locations of buses for every 10 seconds. And we're also looking at ticketing information from our metro services. So uh, here, what we're doing is evaluating the potential of our mode shifts, gaps in our last mile connectivities to reduce the burden of uh, congestion, specifically on our roads in uh, Bangalore. Uh, this is a mobility benchmarking study. And uh, really with the help of these indicators, we're trying to assess uh, how connected and accessible our cities are. Mobility, you know, the questions we try to ask here, how well does a city move and how safe is it? Uh, so we work on road safety projects such as these where we use crash data from FIRs, which we get from, uh, you know, uh, our uh, uh, police databases. Uh, we geolocate these accidents, identify black spots, and, you know, that we now know that our, most of our fatalities are at intersections. Can we correlate this with road design, you know, is it a poor turning radius? Uh, was it a high speed limit? Can we identify strategies to fix all of these issues? This uh, is an interesting application of machine learning, uh, you know, where we hope to quantify crowds. Now, currently there's no means of, you know, uh, quantifying footfall in public spaces. We have no means of estimating exact counts of footfall in a given city, you know, and there've been past instances of foot over bridges collapsing, stampedes due to overcrowding, and I'd like to point out that, you know, this is from February 2021 uh, during COVID time. So you can imagine how much more crowded these spaces tend to get. So using the uh, camera fees, what we're doing here is developing AI models uh, to help extract metrics such as footfall density, uh, crowd speeds. And uh, we're looking at the spatial and temporal trends to assess conflict points and stress zones uh, during peak hours. And uh, along with this, we're also building uh, models that can do this for pedestrian and vehicle detection for some of our road safety and uh, design projects. Uh, in, in this uh, emerging EV space, you know, we're identifying ideal locations for setting up electric charging infrastructure by uh, identifying demand clusters. So here again, we're bringing together multiple data sets, population projections, vehicle ownership, traffic flows, presence of petrol stations, parking lots to assess the feasibility of these charging stations. Finally, environment and climate change, you know, it's been in the news lately, the very uh, alarming IPCC report, you know, has shown that uh, GHG emissions um, from human activities have been responsible for uh, approximately one degree of warming over the last hundred years. And uh, over the next 20 years, our temperatures are expected to most likely exceed 1.5 degrees. Uh, and we know that the effects of climate change are experienced unequally, unevenly in cities. Uh, with the urban poor facing the brunt of it as they lack sufficient infrastructure to respond to these risks. Um, so we're currently using a WRI framework uh, called UCRA, which is the Urban Community Resilience uh, Assessment to measure these uh, differentiated city uh, risks across us. Um, so we looked at the impacts of heat on low income settlements and what we found was a five degree difference in temperatures between neighboring settlements. 
Um, and you know, this was essentially caused due to lack of green cover, choice of roofing material, and high densities uh, that was causing these extreme microclimates. These are urban heat island maps uh, for three smart cities. Um, and uh, again, they're typically used for site-specific heat mitigation strategies. So these dark red spots indicate a change of almost 0.75 degree change over the last six years. Uh, last weekend, you know, Delhi where I live saw record rainfalls and, uh, you know, the entire city was uh, waterlogged, including uh, parts of my own apartment. And uh, we received uh, the highest, uh, I think, 24 hour rainfall this year in 125 years. And since Saturday, I think we've seen record rating rains in uh, Orissa, uh, in uh, Rajkot, Gujarat, and all of this in the last few days. Uh, so we are definitely experiencing more extreme rainfall events and past data also is indi indicative of, uh, you know, these increasing trends. So uh, this is data collected from rain gauges in Mumbai. We've been able to establish that the frequency of these extreme events is increasing. Uh, how do we better equip our cities to handle these, uh, you know, changing environments? As we're building high resolution hydrological models here to simulate flood events for uh, varying uh, rainfall events. Uh, you know, so we are highlighting affected communities. Can we redesign our infrastructure with better storm water management strategies? Um, what happens to metro access? You know, it allows us to provide targeted interventions for our city. Um, here we're working with the mayor's office on a comprehensive disaster management guidelines document for the city of Kochi. Um, this is a climate and land use alliance project where we are accurately computing greenhouse gas inventories for Mumbai. Um, again, using uh, satellite imagery to classify land use and computing uh, removals from green cover. Uh, and for a lot of our, you know, urban development projects, you know, we begin our work by building these biodiversity maps. Uh, so sa using satellite imagery, you know, we derive temperature changes and built up, which invariably leads to uh, decreasing blue-green covers and increasing surface temperatures. So, you know, they help us prioritize localized interventions using uh, nature-based solutions. Uh, this was also an interesting one where we looked at data for the past 20 years. Uh, we were able to plot uh, uh, PM 2.5 particles in Delhi. And as you can see, it's not just temporal trends. Uh, we could also act, assess spatial hotspots. So can we provide, you know, uh, some interventions to uh, vulnerable areas such as schools and low-income communities? Uh, can we tie these with source apportionment studies? You know, is the source of emission uh, caused by traffic or waste burning? Uh, you know, knowing all of this can help us provide uh, uh, interventions at a ward or a neighborhood level. Finally, uh, uh, to strengthen water resilience of cities, we're looking at groundwater prospects and uh, potential recharge zones using GIS remote sensing. Uh, and here what we've done is uh, we've overlaid built up growth over water recharge zones. And what we've seen is that almost 45% of uh, new urban development has come up on areas um, with very high recharge potential. So an estimated 300 billion liters of water is now being diverted away from underground aquifers due to the change of these urban permeable surfaces. So by mapping these layers, you know, it helps us understand the consequences of our past uh, development choices and uh, contributes to more informed decision making. If you're looking at, uh, you really want to look at even more maps, um, uh, you know, please do check out the maps and publications booth uh, on the platform post this session. Uh, you know, finally to conclude, we have all of these investments that are currently being made to improve our urban basic infrastructure. So with data-led planning, you know, we really need to ensure that these investments deliver on the three pillars of our SDG goals, um, which are economic, environmental, and social uh, sustainability. Um, and finally, uh, you know, the bottom line is yes, we need good data for providing meaningful, actionable insight for our cities. You know, it's absolutely critical for us to have reliable, accurate, high resolution data. And, uh, you know, this cannot be created and maintained in silos. You know, there has to emerge better trust, transparency for better collaborations between, you know, the government, private sector, civic society, to build a data ecosystem that is sustainable over time. You know, so cross-sectoral data sets will allow us to come up with unique solutions that are urgently required to make our cities uh, greener, cleaner, and more inclusive. And, uh, you know, with the new guidelines, I, I think it's a, a definitely a progressive move, a step in the right direction. And uh, we hope that this will lead to more evidence-based data-driven governance and uh, policy making. 
Uh, so that's all from me. Uh, I will hand it over now to my colleague uh, Raj, uh, who will uh, maybe highlight a few of our data challenges that we've had um, in all of the projects that we do here in WRI. Great. Thanks, Bina. Um, good afternoon, everyone. So, uh, yeah, just sharing this. Uh, so, uh, the applications that uh, Bina is showing, actually, we, these are the current projects that we are doing as a team right now. Um, so, we have been working on a lots of these projects for uh, so long and uh, in, in uh, uh, retrospect, actually, we, we thought, uh, you know, it's not just about the solutions, but we need to talk about the enabling environment behind uh, these solutions that, I mean, only then we will be able to make some uh, uh, interesting drives in this field. That's what we uh, think right now. Uh, so I just want to talk about a little, I mean, uh, uh, on uh, the context, this is for the general audience uh, who are here, uh, what we are going to discuss about and uh, what is this uh, total, uh, you know, everything for the next one and one and a half hours. Um, so geospatial data has uh, two aspects. One is, I mean, from my view, it has two aspects. One is the civilian or the commercial applications that you see every day which you might be using it for uh, Swiggy or Zometo or, or whatever it is. And, but there is also one more site which uh, the general public will not use, but uh, uh, I mean, directly they will not be using it, but indirectly it is a, a, a critical one, which is the governance, how it can be used for governance and planning. That is very critical. And uh, these are the two aspects that we need to look at. Um, sometimes uh, one uh, gets uh, you know, more importance than the other, but uh, it's, these two are very critical in driving the industry. Um, so, with this in uh, hand, uh, there have been so many policies uh, uh, at the union level, at uh, state level, that have been created over time to address a lot of the concerns. Uh, uh, so some of them have been listed here. We have been doing a study on that. Uh, um, and we were trying to address what was the problem and what are the best ways forward uh, with respect to policies. And uh, and uh, I mean, if we, if we want to do what, uh, uh, what type of work Bina was showing, uh, at an institutional level by the government, you need to address, uh, first is the first thing you need to address is policies. Um, what are the, what is the enabling environment? What are the policies that are uh, allowing you to create data, allowing you to share data, et cetera. And the second aspect is the uh, institution that will execute it, right? So that is uh, who, who will do these technical works. Uh, where is the capacity for it? Uh, human resource or material resource that we want, et cetera. The third is the process, right? So that is something that we don't discuss a lot, but uh, process like, uh, um, uh, even if you have institutions like uh, what we have listed, some of the institutions over here, it, uh, uh, many of them have uh, difficulty in doing it, uh, whether it is, uh, I mean, it could be uh, different types of problems, like uh, um, it could be data collection problems, uh, even if sometimes when they collect it, uh, uh, they might not be accurate enough, et cetera, et cetera. There are so many issues that they are facing. Um, so there are a few success stories within India also, but uh, their success is always limited. And uh, usually the success is always on the technical side of things. And uh, how do we convert it into a decision-making uh, you know, success? That is what we are trying to do. And uh, uh, we are just listing a, a few uh, you know, issues that we as an organization have faced in the past, uh, which we think is uh, applicable for uh, the generic society as well, if they want to um, uh, emulate what WRI is doing or uh, you know, uh, those kind of things. So first is uh, data deficiency. So I would like to always say that India is a data deficit environment and uh, we don't have much data about things. Even if we have data, it is not usually in the uh, in a digital format. And even if it is in a digital format, it is not updated regularly. Uh, if it is updated regularly, it is not shared uh, or stored properly or it is not shared. If it is shared, it is still of high cost and it is very difficult for people to buy. And uh, even if it is uh, something that you can afford, uh, uh, people don't have the vision to apply the data. Um, so this is one of the biggest problem that we are seeing from data deficiency till application, uh, data collection till application, we are seeing a series of problems. There is underutilization of data. Our agencies have been working in, a, uh, in silo modes and uh, project modes, and they are not looking at it as a process. Uh, and uh, because of these, uh, we are still not able to, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, take the benefit of this industry to the fullest. That's uh, uh, our opinion. And then one, uh, I mean, at the end, if we, even if we um, demonstrate a successful application, uh, sometimes I have seen that uh, our technology is also 
uh, you know, oversold uh, for uh, issues that it can't solve. It is always thought that uh, there will be some silver bullet from GIS and remote sensing it will solve everything. Uh, so there is overselling as well as underselling, and uh, we are uh, having trouble uh, with respect to that. Uh, it is in this context we need to look at uh, the current policy environment and the institutional environment, and that's why we are having the panel. I don't want to take more time uh, uh, out of this, but I just want to hand over to Ravi. Uh, so we are going to discuss uh, 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 about the opportunities, about the challenges that we are facing in applying these um, things, like what Veena was showing. How do we do it? How do we replicate it? How do we scale it? Right? WRA looks at scaling a lot, and it's not just us replicating it; it's about, about everybody doing it. Uh, one uh, thing is that, uh, uh, of course, uh, Ravi said that he is not uh, uh, an expert, but uh, actually Ravi was also, uh, he was actually a member of the Chief Minister's Committee, Karnataka Chief Minister's Committee to restructure Bangalore, and uh, he was instrumental in uh, uh, planning a, a, a particular an institution as well as a policy, he was drafting it. Uh, it, is, uh, it is called BASIC, that is uh, Bangalore Spatial Information Center, and uh, uh, you can find the documents, it's still there, and uh, he has a lot of expertise in uh, bringing up uh, uh, data and, uh, how, I mean, how to make it work. Um, uh, so, how to make, uh, how to convert data into action, and uh, he has been leading it, and uh, Ravi, it's all yours. Uh, thank you, thank you, Raj. Uh, so, uh, welcome back to all the panelists, and, uh, you know, the two, three things struck me as I saw the presentation. I always knew that one of WRI's core competency was to generate phenomenal maps. And I think Bina, your presentation showed the quality of the maps that you generate. You know, people, I'm sure most of the people in the audience will be following the WRI handle. I also suggest you follow Raj Bhagat's handle because as a hobby, he also puts out very, very interesting charts uh, from geospatial data. And uh, Raj, thank you so much for putting out those alphabet soup of various institutions and the like. And, uh, you know, though he mentioned that, you know, I have about uh, two decades of working with government pro bono, but what is less known is I call myself the patron saint of lost causes. And while Raj said it's a nice acronym, basic Bangalore Spatial Information Center, the reality is despite 20 years of lobbying, it has still not seen the light of day, but we'll come to that in the panel discussion. And I would also wait for, uh, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Vijay Raghavan to join back when we can discuss some of the policy aspects. Now we will go to our panelists and I would request uh, Dr. Roy to initially switch on uh, his uh, video. Uh, Dr. Parsarthi Roy is an ecologist, a visiting fellow University of Hyderabad, uh, he's a former director of IRS, ISRO, Dehradun. He has done loads and loads of work in natural resources mapping. He's been in the field since 1977, but I don't even think terms that we are using today were mainstream. You know, it was the pre-slide rule era in working. He has over 30 PhD students, and one of the models that he crafted uh, on biodiversity was part of the COP11 uh, uh, adoption along with uh, Swaminathan and Kasturi Rangan. Uh, Parsati Roy, uh, currently, uh, Dr. Roy, the question I'd like to ask you is, you have seen this field literally evolve, given that you've been in it since 1977. Could you give us a sense of how the technology here has developed over the years, and where are we currently in terms of technology deployment in the geospatial space? Dr. Roy? Okay, thank you. Very good afternoon, uh, uh, Mr. Ravi Chandran. I think uh, the uh, it is a really, really pleasure to listen uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Vijay Raghavan in his uh, keynote address. And uh, I think the issue which he talked about how we have re reached to this place, uh, probably that was the beginning in 1972, uh, UN Conference on Environment set the tone that environment has to be looked with, with the much better technologies. And that's where the 1973 uh, United States launched a Earth Observation uh, Satellite, uh, which was, it was called as a uh, Earth uh, Technological Satellite and later named as a Landsat. 
and the almost same time i came in picture in uh, as a, from the state from the university i joined a university of karlsruhe started seeing satellite data these were analog data and uh, uh, came back after two years to uh, india uh, and joined the national remote sensing center which was a pioneer department for receiving and uh, processing satellite data at that time we used to get data from the us and uh, uh, they were analog form mostly and uh, uh, mostly interpretations were uh, visual interpretation looking at the picture and getting information uh, subsequently one of the uh, major task which was uh, uh, professor satish dhawan prompted at a national level was forest cover mapping of india and uh, that time you know the silent valley issue was on very hot and uh, people were talking about deforestation in india and uh, that's where the uh, existing satellite data uh, purchased from uh, us uh, nasa and current satellite data were utilized to map the forest cover and uh, we had a forest st statistics uh, which really shook the uh, forestry sector in india uh, over the years isro made a uh, quite uh, important contribution in launching a state of art earth observation satellite they were the best at that time and uh, they provided data on land ocean for weather uh, uh, weather forecasting and all these efforts uh, they led to a situation where we need not, we did not buy data from us we had our own data data became cheaper and uh, isro proactively promoted dissemination of data, data to the different stakeholders we also demonstrated uh, uh, through inter uh, interinstitutional collaboration how this data sets can be utilized as it has been said uh, the rich countries they have uh, uh, best maps and they have up to date maps the current information because data is most valuable thing and that is the period uh, the whole operational concept of remote sensing came in pic uh, picture it is something like late late 80s and uh, uh, india started uh, working with the stakeholder institutions and built up a uh, potential applications in the field of natural resource management and uh, uh, i can uh, tell you the india is a one among the few countries which has such a comprehensive natural resource database somewhere during that time uh, india confronted some of the map uh, issues uh, because uh, the uh, the maps were not open for putting uh, the satellite information on the map you needed a open policy on the uh, topographical map so that readability of the satellite products can be increased now uh, that is the period when uh, there was a, a, a discussion came up for map policy and uh, there was some map policy and topographical map were divided into two categories one is open source map uh, open uh, maps another one is defense related maps but that was a very small beginning i can tell you uh, world was progressing very fast uh, there was a Uh, satellite data nasa made available uh, modis uh, landsat uh, satellite freely available from the very beginning 1975 onwards these are science data european space agency made data sentinel series of data fully fully free which is about 10 meter and 5 meter the ground resolution many of the part is covered by planet satellite which are again very high resolution Right so uh, uh, the basically uh, basically uh, the uh, there has been a parallel development in open source tools uh, open source processing softwares the analytics part also came into and that's where uh, 
the integration of technology took place gps gis and large computing system cloud information came in picture and uh, uh, requirement of more and more open policy was required and uh, i would say that uh, the information uh, on the uh, uh, position became very important and uh, uh, the entrepreneurship building a business required a position data and that's where the technology demanded open uh, map policy and that i consider that uh, the present geospatial policy which has been announced by the present government has been a major milestone however the uh, the new policy which has come on drone is also a major milestone however the uh, if you want to make this data set open you need further uh, policy level changes which makes data for scientific analysis you have a, a open a policy for sharing the existing data sets for monitoring purposes you also need a certain kind of informations like topographical information the science based corrected satellite data for uh, analysis and processing i think i will stop here and uh, 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 i will come back if the required uh, i am asked to answer some questions and queries thank you thank you dr roy we will be coming back to some of the issues that you have raised particularly in the light of the new policy which has very good features but could have a few more about information sharing protocols and the like and it's also heartening to see that in our journey since 77 there's been a lot of adoption of open standards and which really is the way for a country like india to go over getting locked up with any proprietary software i would next like to go to dr anjana vyas uh, i mean she has over 40 years of uh, experience here in academics and research uh, you know dr vijay raghavan i must mention you twice called me a doctor i am no doctor i am a mr <laughs> but for half an hour i said let me enjoy my doctor status <laughs> so just so just a little correction out there but this panel does have pretty weighty doctors and dr vyas is one of them uh, apart from academics and research i think she's a pioneer who developed a master's course for geomatics uh, she's been uh, specialized in remote sensing gis urban planning governance data science has been part of international archives on photogrammetry remote sensing she's been the chairperson part of expert committees at dst i could go on but you get the sense uh, dr vyas my interest in where you are coming from really because people keep talking about capacity building capacity building and you cannot attend a seminar without the word capacity building being used and you are at the epicenter for geo uh, spatial in a certain sense so give us a sense of what is the state of education and you have a belief that we need more of an interdisciplinary approach and not just a silo based approach i would like you to elaborate on that you also have some ideas about how to strengthen academia industry government kind of partnerships operating out of academia and the thing i found most interesting talking to you ahead of this session you said that there's a chance to catch them young that even geography classes in school can be taught with an element of spatial thinking so i'd like you to elaborate on a few of these things to give us a sense of where we are in this whole area of uh, geospatial education over to you professor vyas yeah thank you so much uh, for a very apt question on education uh education is always uh, considered for the uh, establishing the base and basis for the further growth processes when we are talking about geospatial technology and uh, what uh, professor parthasarthi has talked about is a, is a process of the growth of the 
remote sensing and geospatial technology uh, in India and how it is paced with the kind of uh, uh, keeping the um, and helping hand to the academics and academician. We, we know that Indian Institute of Remote Sensing, one of the most pioneer academic institution, I think it is 55 years plus old and has been giving education and capacity programs to cross the uh, 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 sectors and the domains uh, in government or in the infrastructure, environment, water, etc. etc. Uh, Igniting the mind of youth of the people, young generation is very important thing and hence we require the standard education system. And this standard education system for this geospatial technology is very, very important. In India, across 200 institutions and universities are today giving the education at uh, uh, less number in graduation, but large number in the uh, post-graduation and PhD level. Uh, we have been, Raj has shown some of the policies and we have been looking into the policy, starting with the map policy and to the uh, use policy and to the dissemination uh, aspect of the policy. Uh, not going to very old uh, type of policies, but we say that national map policy of 2005 or National Geospatial Data Infrastructure of 2006, and so on, remote sensing data policy. Several policies has come up as and when the uh, uh, space technology has grown in India, and we have grown with the kind of new and updated and, and, and enhanced the policy. The task force, this national task force during 2013 has, has very prominently have shown the importance of the geospatial education. And, and they, it is mentioned the requirement of the geospatial education, the skilled workforce. And they said that the education should be intermingling with respect to three typology of workforce to be produced. One is requirement of a skilled labor workforce. Uh, uh, second is the technical geospatial uh, professionals. And third is the geospatial experts or managers. And we know that the, there is always a professional market pyramid. And that pyramid needs to be taken care of with respect to the, the larger, uh, to the uh, smaller, and expertise level of um, understanding of that. The recently, this education has uh, probably is getting more and more encouraged by the people and very recent inclusion by AICT in the uh, approving of the geospatial uh, technology subject in this uh, national eligibility test, uh, NET and GATE. And these are all is very important aspect of, of happening of this um, uh, geospatial education in, in this world. And, and, and again, as you have rightly mentioned that recent education policy, which I consider is a cross border education. It is uh, not in the domain of the one what you are learning. You are learning uh, medical or engineering or any other thing, what is most important is that would you need to learn psychology or would you need to learn the financial management or what you really need to know and if that are possible to ac access to those kind of things through the new policy. I think geospatial technology umbrella has opened up quite drastically because it has a potentiality of location as well as business intelligence and both are required in, in any type or any kind of uh, 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 the requirement of the domains. Now, when we talk about the education, there are very, I, I, I come out with two important things. One is the education level, content and pedagogy. And another one is the post, uh, post uh, your study, what is your professional uh, 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 happenings, okay? So whichever is the degree specialization uh, student go for, is always recognized recognize only when they fetch good professional career and good number of jobs. Uh, we see that our neighboring uh, nations or maybe in the Western world, 
geospatial technology graduates are getting very good job and it considered to be to top five or top 10 jobs. Uh, the situation in India is really differ. Okay. Uh, but GUI government of India initiatives are also time and again, they enhances the scales for GRF, SRF, but probably there still may be a lesser in terms of the other grad, uh, graduates from other specializations uh, from elsewhere or something. So, but then we, if we consider that uh, uh, some of these aspects, why this is not happening uh, or geospatial technology is not, not becoming more and more uh, popular by the young people to learn and study. One of the committee report when I was reading, it is written that actual scope of geospatial sector is not realized due to the lack of awareness. Now, this is a very critical question uh, for the academician, for the government, for the industry, and I think entire ecosystem of, uh, of uh, geospatial technology that having eminent institution completing 55 years, having the policy so old, 70s and we have started bringing the satellite data and, and giving to the people, why it is still not having an awareness. And here we have to take a, a proactive step in terms of demand, raise the demand for the skilled, geospatially skilled people. Okay, and manpower. And how it is also, we can just try to take it up is also with respect to the strong industry linkages. Now, uh, that is for two purposes. One is for training, what industry needs, academia can try to figure it out along with the industry linkage and then try to give it to them. And another one is the placement. So training and placement, enhancing or strengthening of these two things will obviously enhance the geospatial education in India and the, the, the young generation will really get ahead in terms of um, learning more and more. Just last word I would tell that today, uh, the employment of, uh, in the nation level, employment of geospatial uh, graduates are only 2,50,000. It is quoted in AGI, one of the uh, document, okay. And, and like 2,50,000 people in entire India is employed. So what is the problem? And these problems are really needs to be looked into that how we can just uh, enhance that to what scale. And then only we can try to address that committee's um, comment on that uh, uh, geospatial is lack of awareness. And I think we should get onto this discussion uh, further more detail uh, in time to go. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Vyas, and you make very relevant points that, you know, uh, studying geospatial uh, and geomatic should be an aspirational thing. There should be placement and training, and maybe we'll request WRI to scale up their geospatial division as a first step. Uh, moving on, uh, I'm going to bring in Dr. Vinod Botale, who's the Associate Director of NRSC ISRO in Hyderabad. It's from IIT Roorkee. He calls himself as self-taught in GIS. So Professor Vyas said uh, he didn't know of your existence at that point of time. So uh, he has managed ground segment for satellite data acquisition processing and watershed development in Rajasthan. Uh, from what I gathered from Dr. Botle, his focus over the years, particularly the last decade, has been on software solutions, the NRIS, the India Varis, the Bhuvan portal uh, and the like. So, Dr. Botley, my question to you really is, uh, you know, you have now dealt in terms of when you come up with these software solutions, there are certain things that you think are required, and there are some that you elicit from potential users. Give us a sense in terms of what's the state of software solutions in the space currently. And secondly, in terms of this uh, elicitation of user requirements and the like, how evolved are we and mature are we in terms of being able to define that, Dr. Botley. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ravichandar. Oh, my, Mr. Mr., please. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ravichandar. And uh, it's really a great pleasure to be here. And uh, uh, we could get a very uh, nice uh, uh, keynote address from Professor Vijay Raghunji. Mm, and it's always good to see him, his present face and always good points. I, I think this third or fourth time I'm uh, 
in discussion uh, when he was chairing the meeting and i think the previous was uh, when he chaired the 9th uh, pm stic uh, science and technology innovation council where i was one of the invitee for specifically the geo special sector uh, making the infrastructure and data strategy i think uh, that is also one of the could be point uh, which has taken forward by him very uh, seriously the inputs received during this thing and uh, today we have geo special data guidelines in place and also the drone rules and i think uh, a lot of efforts have been made by the government uh, so that the data is open and more usable uh, to the people now with regard to sir uh, your uh, specific points uh, one more thing which what we have to uh, see is that it today is a very important day i feel because one is that engineers day uh, a very important occasion and uh, in this week also we are completing 6 years uh, into september 2015 honorable uh, prime minister uh, had conducted a national meet uh, where he addressed that various departments uh, to you how to use the space technologies in their governance and since the today's topic is governance and planning i will be little focusing on that part also but uh, specifically in terms of uh, uh, software solutions uh, since i was involved in from 90s when the first uh, gis that time it was of course commercial gis which came into india and we started using it for providing solution to the rajasthan government for watershed uh, information system and revenue reclamation uh, kind of things so from that journey uh, we i could see the actual development with the users something like uh, india varis wherein there was a proactive initiative from the ministry of water resources central water commission to come out with a country wide uh, water level information system so user requirement uh, when we talk about specifically uh, this is a proactive step where some user is coming out with a problem uh, they have defined the various problems wherein you need to design a solution this is one thing which wherein uh, actually the solution becomes easier to do because your problems are known uh, you need to design you need to analyze and then develop uh, test and re deploy uh, there are certain initiatives like for example now bhuvan bhuvan i have been also the founding member and we a few people initially Uh, launched bhuvan with a self conceived idea of uh, you can say more with anticipating the needs of the possibly the decision making portal earlier like as you mentioned about the national resources information system project which was the first initiative in india in the digital domain it was digital domain wherein uh, district level databases have been prepared and uh, decision makers like specifically like collectors they had been given the uh, database digital databases along with the decision making tools Uh, but uh, subsequently when we uh, look into the bhuvan it uh, uh, actually took that kind of back end but it is it make it web enabled so that it becomes so and it becomes a common framework which is a uh, you can say the proactively developed one which is a generic solution but it can be customized further for any particular ministry or any particular user but in this case when the user requirement comes because this is already a generalized uh, developed portal many times user requirements are little fuzzy or maybe not under, I mean, not well known so sometimes you have to anticipate and develop the uh, things so whenever there is a reactive kind of uh, mechanism wherever user has already defined the problem and solution is being to develop it becomes fast but whenever there is a proactive uh, whenever there is a proactive whenever there is a proactive solution uh, project problem the user it becomes fast when there is a reactive mechanism that you are developing something common portal and then you are expecting from something to else come there no naturally that the life cycle of the solution uh, making becomes the different typical now uh, in this particular uh, era when uh, you would see that uh, india uh, the geo special readiness ind index if we look into last 2 uh, 3 years survey which was done by the market india stood 926th in the 50 nation uh, list it means we are just in the middle uh, where the it shows that uh, in next 5 years the global geo special solution market is going to touch something like 700 billion dollar and uh, we are 26 definitely we have large scope to improve further uh, use this uh, the ma the ma mechanism which has been opened up by the government in various sectors uh, it is not only for the private but even in the government where entire workflows of the departments could be in the put in the automated way and a decision making and uh, such solutions can be given and if user requirements flows very fluidly uh, there, if there is something like a geo special advisor in each department who talks to the department internals and then come out with some plan 
which can be further uh, put in place it could be a really great solution uh, to uh, uh, to use this opportunity in this case we uh, we say okay, so your uh, your solution market is directly impacted by the user requirements so well thought requirements uh, reduces the time for the whole uh, solution based so most of the geo special based workflows if we implement it can be a really great today one example i can just give you uh, where is a very useful example uh, ministry of rural development which has taken and uh, bhuvan has implemented uh, manrega scheme so essentially this entire workflow has been implemented and it's a very nice combination synergy combination between the department of space and the nic where the handholding has been carried out so wherever every work which is carried out on ground gets into the workflow their pictures come on daily basis uh, work progress is being seen and then even the initiation for the payment is being done from the bhuvan it goes to the clearance for the to nic portal and further it happens so entire workflow gets automated so here the actual governance scheme can be seen here another good example could be a, in urban sector it could be like uh, housing for all wherein again same thing the housing for all uh, scheme which is specifically meant for the weaker sections where the weaker beneficiary has to be uh, get an advantage of that entire workflow has been automated to see the progress right from the uh, no progress to the uh, foundation level to the lintel level to the slab level to the completion level and finally handing over to the beneficiary so such kind of mechanisms or ease of business which has been used by ministry of culture today to provide the building permissions from the bhuvan portal so such kind of initiatives where there is a initiation from the departments and more of a job becomes simpler in terms of user requirements and building a solution uh, it's a, a great opportunity so now uh, in this slide i would uh, say that uh, a kind of mechanism if we along with this uh, geo special data, data guidelines which has now paved the way uh for various uh, application sectors uh, to boom i will say because uh, micro level details specifically which were not able to get this policy will allow such kind of details to get and actions or solutions are very important if they are actionable they become more and more important or more and more relevant so if solution is important but solution should be action oriented and we must go for the descriptive and prescriptive business intelligence henceforth thank you very much for Thank you, Dr. Botley. And it's heartening to note that a lot of these are finding practical applications. And you know, you mentioned Menrega and some of the other applications. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, next, we go, you know, uh, to Nikhil Kumar, who's the president geospatial Map My India. Uh, you know, whether you're prime minister or finance minister over the years, they keep talking about that we must unleash the animal spirits in the market. That's a commonly used phrase. And on this panel, Nikhil Kumar would represent the animal spirits, given that he's in the private sector market of the geospatial space. He has over 27 years in the field, uh, earlier at Here Technologies before joining uh, Map My India recently. And when I was talking to him, he actually made my job a bit simple by providing a four pillar ecosystem framework to think about geospatial uh, uh, ecosystem. So over to you, Nikhil. Thank you, Ravi. Uh, it was great. Uh, and thank you, WRI, for this opportunity to have such a great panel and confabulate and discuss with this elite panel. So I will begin with uh, some handful of, uh, you know, thanks and gratitude. Uh, this is 15 February, after 15 February and before 15 February. So Raj was mentioning a lot of policies which were not very, uh, you know, conducive. Uh, for the geospatial industry to work upon. But that's, that's gone. 15, 15 February onwards, we see a completely liberated policy already in place. And uh, being in private sector, we can actually see how this is kind of helping. So, uh, and then, then further accentuated by drone policy. Uh, so these two are, I mean, we must express our gratitude at part of industry, Map My India, my CMD and CEO, Mr. Verma, Dakesh Verma and Rohan Verma for this enormous space. And, and, and of course, letting the animal unleash uh, is, is uh, and just taking your phrase forward. Now, uh, I, will, I will talk here, since it is uh, under the ages of this new policy we are talking, a lot of people talk to me that, uh, you know, a lot of geospatial work was already happening. What has happened on 15 February and what impact it could make? That's, that's one thing that we'll talk about. The second thing I will talk about, the question uh, that you asked me, 
when we were getting into this conversation. Where are we? Where do we want to go? And what do we need to make that happen? So these are, these are the two things I will talk on. But before I go to that level, I will just take a step back and see what is the four pillars uh, that we spoke about the other day. So the way I look at, and I will try to align as to how this new policy has impacted in unleashing this animal. So one is the way I look at is the one frame, which is one pillar, which is a user community. And what are those and who are those? So one is the data creators and not necessarily they are data owners. Somebody I heard uh, in, I mean, before this, there was another session by Geospatial World and somebody said, no, I see data as a sunlight. Well, very true. Uh, for the fact that it should be in terms of the virtue ubiquitous to all, it is a sunlight. But when we talk about data also as a fuel, there has to be ownership. And there is a premium that somebody has to earn out of owning that. So yeah, so the one is the data creators who either do it for themselves, they own it, do it for others. So that's one part. The second part is with presumers. And that's where I will bring in this enhanced understanding of geospatial as contextual convergence of technology, wherein a lot of applications are happening worldwide. And the reason why in geospatial industry, we are still not being able to evolve big time because we are keeping everything you know, within the boundaries. So our ability to create you know, geospatial context into huge sets of application, starting from gamification to socioeconomic application to monitoring of direct benefit schemes, you can name it, agriculture, all that kind of things required that the people who are developing these application are not the core geospatial guys. So how we enable them, and, and that's where I bring in this presumer varieties who actually ingest all these location context into various applications that they are unfolding. And the third is the consumer, and the consumer could be me, you, everybody, large businesses, organizations, who are actually making the benefit out of this application and the data. So that's one paradigm. The second paradigm for me is the geospatial technology continuum, which is, you know, people create it, which is starting different type of technology in use. Um, you know, Dr. PSY talked about earth observatory, satellite imageries, drone is another way. Then we have terrestrial data capture, which is LIDAR, uh, we have optical sensors, we have GNSS, all that. The Government of India also came out with a very important step on CORS, continuously operating reference tension. Because however accurate the data you capture, if it's not actually aligned with a uniform coordinate frame, it will, it will miss the higher objectives. So, so, so that's, that's different level, different types of data creating, created from different means and different technology. So that's one part in the continuum frame. The second is the processing and modeling. I believe that a data is a data and it gets converted into a content when it is extended for use in your application. So this converge, con, conversion of raw data or data into content, there is a huge industry. People make software which allows you to manipulate, manage, model the data based on the actual uses and the application. So that's the second frame. The third frame, once you have created that content, you like to visualize it, analyze it. And this could be enormous. Any, any sector that you talk about, you, you know, I don't need to go in detail of that. So that's the third segment. And first, when we have analyzed it, visualized it, created it, somebody might require just the data, somebody might require just the content, somebody might require to visualize analytics. How do you extend that? And that's what I'm doing, publishing and sharing. Whether it is a portal, uh, whichever way you do it. So these are the four of the geospatial continuum side. And the third is for me, which is how do you, in terms of when you extend it, are you doing offline? Even earlier days, people used to get cities or you are actually doing that an online mode, an offline mode, a hybrid mode where there is a business layer, which is very confidential and that cannot be disseminated openly. Of course, you have to adhere to the sanctity of the data this, in, uh, and still, provide the backend engine to entice various applications around it. So it could be hybrid or it could be on-prem or it could be online. That's the model of engagement or model of deployment. So, uh, and the fourth is uh, different ministries, different sectors using it. Uh, 
whether it is, uh, and that could be diverse. Uh, somebody can say, okay, how can commercialization can happen? Like you asked me, where do you see? I mean, we are a big industry making huge impact. If we are through use of geospatial technology saving a life, it's a huge impact. You cannot put a dollar around it. But what I would like to see that also is achieved. We can also put a dollar and say, okay, our industry, which we are planning to have one, one lakh crore by 2030, we are actually able to achieve that, which is real commercial gain and the industry will benefit. A whole ecosystem will be created. We will impact the GDP through the geospatial industry itself. So that's the wish list I have. And I will come as to how we'll achieve that. So, so the, these, are, these are the sectors that I was talking and I was talking two different and diverse sectors. One is the socioeconomic side, which is agriculture, more crop per drop, precision agriculture. We require a huge amount of precision in the way we, uh, right from the field preparation to, to crop management, to harvesting, the entire continuum of agriculture, how geospatial find a way. And I'm not going to teach here because everybody knows that, that it's useful. So I'm not here talking about where is GIS, GIS useful. I'm just trying how this benefit, post this policy, this is these are the sectors which are going to benefit. And I will I will come one by one on that. So this is a socioeconomic. The, if you see the large industrial or commercial sex sectors, how geospatial has spurred uh, and it's likely to do more. So we were saying car, in autonomous car, in dash navigation, everybody, you and I have seen, you know, navigation in a car, which was a simple car offline dashboard. From there, it become, you know, a, a connected car. From connected car, it become car as a service. From car as a service, it became mobility as a service. And that's where, uh, you know, Bina was alluding to when she was talking about urban harmonization. And, and geospatial will play not only a role from providing accurate and precision, you know, navigation, but also connecting different dots and providing you lot in, in the sense of over the air, uh, you know, management of the entire fleet. So that's one sector, supply chain logistics. You know, 14% is our transportation cost in India. We need to reduce that use, using this geospatial. So, so these are the sectoral aspect on the commercial side, and on, and on the on the you know socioeconomic side, so the value I'm trying to see from the policy that has seen is the areas which we could not do, we could not map map every POI. Today we can, and that as a service we can provide, which will actually provide huge amount of benefit to these commercial sectors that I talk about. The benefits, direct benefit schemes, a lot, lot of social like Anganbari, which areas that cater to that requires every household to be geo addressed. All these kind of remote area which were not accessible through drone we can map we can provide health services to those locations find a proof of delivery and stamp it on our geospatial layer so these are the segments which we could not do earlier freely which we can do freely we, the construction segment which requires not only sir yeah so thanks nikhil we'll come back to that because we're running a little out of time and i know the next part you wanted to talk was governance and policy yeah and the panel discussion will focus on the governance and policy so thank you so much for laying out the entire four pillars and the various areas that it can be used. We will come to governance and policy, which you wanted to move to once we get to the panel discussion. My last uh, speaker for the day uh, uh, is uh, Meera of Citizen Matters and Urwani Foundation. She is the co-founder as well as the managing trustee of the foundation. Uh, I'm also linking a question that has come from Waliapan Manikam of Trustee Water Collaborators saying that why is community ignored when we talk about all these spatial data sets and the like? So Mira, since you have done a lot of work with finding this data, which WRI seems to easily get the data, which you have a lot of difficulty getting, how you try to put that data available for citizens out there through your open data platform. And you work with a lot of communities in trying to get them to uh, understand the data, contribute to the data. So will you please uh, give us a sense of what is the community hunger for data and your experience of working in this space. And uh, Meera, we normally say we are citizen centric. I'm sorry, but we have come to the citizen at the last end of the of the speakers. Over to you, Meera. Thanks, Ravi. I don't know if that speaks for itself that I'm the last in the list, but yeah, uh, just to kind of share my experience having been in the civic space in the last uh, so many years, uh, the two things I have learned. So one, 
is that uh, data, including spatial data, is central to better governance and civic engagement. Okay, and more importantly, people really, really care about data. Right now, with the ubiquitousness of smartphones, people are used to uh, you know seeing maps. It's the concept of spatial information is internalized now. So it's not something that only academics and experts actually engage with. Average people, lay people on the streets actually understand spatial data. And now, you know, especially people who are in, involved in civic issues really care about it. So, uh, you know, they're looking for kind of the quantitative information that helps them understand the state of their neighborhoods, their city. Uh, they want to see budgets and expense, spatial view of all the projects that are going on. And, you know, what is the planned work? How is it going to affect my street? Uh, what is the various, I mean, the state of execution and so on. So people actually, uh, you know, feel this is something that matters and it matters to them in their daily lives, right? These are the pain points that people go through. Uh, but unfortunately, data, you know, especially in the civic space and maybe true for all spaces, is sort of stuck in silos or it's missing. Even your city corporation, for example, today's, uh, you know, there was this news about uh, replacing all the street lights with LED lamps and then, uh, you know, and still large parts of the city are, uh, you know, are in darkness. Like, where is the data of list of, let's say, uh, the streetlight assets? Does the city actually have something like that? And if it's not, how do you actually, uh, you know, go and gather that? So uh, that's one of the reason that, uh, you know, to complement our work as uh, at Citizen Matters, which is a civic media platform, we have an open data platform, an urban data platform called Open City. So where we are the, the collators, the curators, and the editors, uh, one, we focus on opening up data collating data and we also do collaborative data gathering because even within the government there are, there are data sets which are missing and it's uh, sort of natural in a you know developing country but it's something it is possible to work together and fill these gaps is the point you're trying to make right so there have been many of these uh, you know citizen science projects science projects like you know mapping which are the garbage spots which are the trees in a neighborhood biodiversity and you know street lights for example so and we also have people actually ask reaching out and asking for data do you have this map do you have uh, you know this sort of budget document etc so the goal overall is to you know we're talking about uh, data driven driven decision making but the idea is to bring citizen participation into it uh, so it's not just about the decision making part but it also brings in the you know the transparency and accountability right i think nikhil kumar talked about sunlight and sunlight is also the best disinfectant so uh, from that perspective you know you, we see people using the data, like I said, we also see journalists, not just in citizen matters, but as well as civic groups actually using this data for their advocacy, their lobbying, and they have to inform their us, like, you know, not just to go and say, hey, you know, we don't have toilets in the, enough toilets in the public toilets in the neighborhood, but you actually have data to show that in a city of 12 million, we have 600, 700 toilets and, you know, your per capita availability is really doesn't make sense when you plot it on a map, you know, where things are missing. So uh, just let me just end by like with a couple of examples. I talked about the street lights, right? Uh, uh, we there were a couple of uh, projects which actually where citizens went out and mapped this information. There was a cyclist Anita who went and mapped 650 street lights in six hours, and that was so informative. It kind of proved the point that entire ORR sections, you know, the heart of the IT uh, city, is actually in darkness every evening. Right? And people are going about in cars, they don't realize it. But what about people who are walking on the payments or rather the missing payments? So this kind of proved the point and it's just so much easier to go and then demand you know, better services from the city. And there was another neighborhood which actually went and did an audit of their neighborhood. They created a step-by-step -step guide and saying, this is what we found. And this is, if you in your neighborhood want to do something, these are the steps you follow. So it's really a very powerful way to kind of work with data and use it to be make better cities. So that's, I, I just wanted to kind of share that and there's just lots uh, more we can dive into. As we thank you. So we now have about uh, 20 minutes, 25 minutes for the focus on governance and planning. And I'd like to uh, um, get that kicked off with some uh, remarks by myself, with my own experience. And uh, Dr. Vijay Raghavan, I will be coming with the opening question to you post my little uh, monologue. So essentially, I, you know, uh, uh, Raj earlier referred to the uh, basic project, the Bangalore Spatial Information Center, which over two decades one has worked in trying to put that together uh, in terms of evangelizing it, 
in terms of uh, collecting a base map and all the application layers, putting it together and say, can we run with it? Can we have an information protocol, sharing protocol on who will update the base map, who will update the respective application layers? What will be the protocol for interagency sharing? What will be the protocol for sharing with the public and the like? It has come to naught at one level. So my main, the question I want to come in before that, a few more context. The February policy of the government, both in terms of the geospatial policy that has come out, which makes people like Nikhil Kumar smile because a license raj in some sense has been dismantled. And we are often so much caught up in the Stockholm syndrome that even if we see small things getting removed, we are very delighted saying that there is huge progress. But the geospatial policy and thing that has come out from the government is clearly path breaking. And so also is the drone policy. And both those must be acknowledged. At the same time, we realize that while the central government says this, a lot of the action finally is in the state government. Delhi today has a geospatial act, but most other places don't have it. So we'll have to figure out how to make it happen in the state level. Before I come specifically to my question and what can government do about it, I'd like to share. So when I was evangelizing this idea uh, with the political establishment and the I'd met a former Chief Justice of the Supreme Court with a query saying that, can we find a way, and this is again ties up with the question that Valiapan asks, why can't citizens verify things on the ground that government owns? That's the question that he has asked. In the same context, when I've gone to the former Chief Justice, I mean, Justice of uh, the Supreme Court and posed the following question, that if the government of the day for lakes of Bangalore put out a map showing the lake bed and the buffer zone, which is put out in the public domain that this belongs as urban commons. And if a citizen or a citizen group saw encroachment there, they could then make a representation saying that we see an encroachment on the urban commons. And the question to the justice was, if citizens came to you in the court, assuming the government didn't really respond, can we really crunch court cases and get good resolution? The answer of the Supreme Court justice was yes, yes, yes. All it will require, government puts it out. We will set up a committee which will verify whether the representation is correct on the ground in terms of the encroachment claimed. Is it happened or not happened? And if it is found that it has happened, we can immediately issue orders to restore status quo and protect the commons. I could extend the example to forests and to other places. So it begs the basic question. And when I went back to government, informally I was told that the biggest problem is you're seeking transparency in an environment which is inherently opaque. You know, you spoke about power and asymmetry. The power and asymmetry that government has with government data sets created with uh, 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 citizen taxpayers' money is huge. So my question, sir, is what is the step we can take, baby steps, that we can actually encourage a little more transparency, a little more uh, data sharing? Because if you look at London and San Francisco and the like, all these data sets that we are struggling here are available. And actually private developers are developing solutions, whether it be mobility solutions or water solutions or water leakage solutions, whatever. The private is actually using these and developing solutions, crowdsource, tribal wisdom, uh, wisdom of the crowds, whatever you want to call it. Why can't we think down that route? What's holding back? I can understand legacy issues and the desire for lack of transparency, but what could be done to incentivize government to be more open? Can your funds be tied in saying, we will have an index of transparency before we release more money, something of that kind, because for too long, this asymmetry is affecting the citizen. Dr. Vijay Raghavan. <laughs> We are dealing with questions which have multiple complexities and multiple players and multiple responsibilities. And we're trying to see whether there can be a unipolar solution from the government, right? And 
in a situation where legally as well as functionally there are multiple layers of governance and each of these layers has an interface with citizens and those who elect the government who the government is responsible to so there are both there are two major challenges here one is you, you have addressed largely the one of process what is the process which can be affected that's important and i'll come to that the second is a is a challenge of culture right do we have a culture where the implementation of rules applies to me even when it is inconvenient to me or do i want those rules applied only when it is convenient to me and i demand that the rules be applied to everyone else uh, but i am an exception right and so this is a major cultural issue of exceptionalism in functioning you know you would like the river bed not to be occupied by construction but if you have made an offer you couldn't refuse uh, for a plot of land there to construct a bungalow somehow you feel that okay that's an exception which can be managed or violating a you know rule which requires you not to build another floor on your building and so on and so forth violating norms of uh, you know disaster resilience in construction so there are cultural issues and process issues both here and i think we do ourselves no favors by pushing only on the process issue and not on the cultural issue now what is the solution uh, both need to be addressed i think here technology actually has a role you talked about how you know you can map lakes or river beds and say that this is an encroachment or not and the government should have a map of what is a region but we also already know as citizens what regions are okay to construct and what are not what is an encroachment and what is not and the geospatial policy the drone policy allows you to map this and put this up publicly and make it available to everyone in other words every citizen should be empowered to see what is the law on encroachment and whether there is an encroachment or not and put that information back to the government so this has a citizens level so that kind of a responsibility makes it difficult for anyone uh, those who are citizens who are misusing uh, uh, you know uh, the situation or government uh, which in some context may be you know not noticing or turning a blind eye to look at these kind of issues the last point i'd like to say is a third kind of cultural issue which is a big challenge um, and this is a common challenge across uh, both people and government and societies and this is a syndrome which both forgets calamities very rapidly and you know somehow doesn't look at disaster assessment in a manner which is uh, you know meaningful from a societal context in other words the floods in jhelum if it occurs every 50 years then for 49 years after the flood you know if you live a life which is uh, not keeping in mind that another flash flood will occur in about 50 years then you cannot be but I mean, you cannot pretend to be surprised when the flood comes later but the urge to make a living on attractive high value river beds for 49 years is a challenge so this is a you know a matter which is there across i'm mean, giving jhelum as a example uh, and but this is true of every kind of situation people build uh, apartments in you know seismic zones in uh, california because they are by the coast and they just uh, hope that the big one will not happen so these kinds of issues are both cultural and process issues which we need to do and i think there can be a fix by you know using technology by common people by citizens to say that look these are things which are not on yeah uh, thank you sir in fact uh, i buy your point on the cultural thing that you stressed on and it is clear that citizens have a responsibility responsibility to be good citizens and not violate the rules and the laws and it's equally the onus of government to be good uh, provide good governance so it is both sides i'm not saying that uh, but that 
the point that is often made is that you know citizens have a yes we do cut across traffic lights we do build extra floors i am not for a minute absolving citizenry but the point i was trying to really get at is from a purely government side because we covered government a little less in the overall scheme of things why not they do things a little more proactively as opposed to be in this whole obfuscation kind of mode and you know you mentioned disaster and quick data point i'm sharing again it's a process point of view you know while i was working with the system pro bono i was in the government committee on restructuring while going to various departments to try and put the geo data set together i noticed that the disaster management agency was working off a 1 is to 9 map and i realized i ignore as me i realized that the bda in its latest base map for the master plan had a 1 is to 3 map and they were in silos not willing to share with each other i had to write a note and request the chief secretary to authorize the bda to hand over the 1 is to 3 map to the disaster management which could then do a better modeling now this is not rocket science the point therefore the related point is most things that we as citizens require require integration across silos of government department designed to withstand nuclear attack so we need actually integration for outcomes so is there any thinking in government how do we get this coordination across because most of our structures from the british down have been these silos which get reinforced any ways to break those silos and think outcomes and integration any thinking along those lines sir no you are absolutely right i mean this is an area where there is not only thinking this has been the focus of substantial kinds of measures which are being taken with uh, i would say um, a not insignificant amount of success over here um, i'll give you uh, some examples not directly connected with geospatial policy but geospatial is an example so the whole policy changes came about exactly because of the kinds of synergy which you mentioned in theory it is a department of science and technology which is responsible for bringing out these policy uh, and and the guidelines and so on and so forth and of course that's true in theory and in practice but the way they did that was extraordinary they met with industry to a great extent with uh, citizens with other ministries and there are a whole lot of ministries the defense the home affairs uh, you know panchayati raj uh, everyone else who have discussed with and each of them have you know their own views about what can be done and what can't be done but it's rather remarkable that there was a intention to open up that was true about drones about geospatial uh, and it's also about the space uh, restructuring so the space restructuring again uh, you know i'll give you this example because it's particularly relevant to what you're talking about now space had for a long time outlined what it thought was necessary in the area of remote sensing and putting out satellites for biodiversity for education for mapping waterways for you know um uh looking at um, um you know himalayan ecosystems and melting uh, and so on and so forth now all of this each of these components is linked to potentially a user ministry and to state governments and so on so forth. and before putting that up space used to ask these people do you think this is a good idea and they were absolutely wonderful not only this we would like so much more we would like you know uh, lidars and we would like these other kinds of surveys and all of that and space used to say wonderful and put up appropriate satellites then it was discovered because none of the user ministries were actually paying for this right they had the generous heart to say what they wanted and space put it up use was not optimal this changed dramatically you know a few months ago about a year ago when space now puts up satellites only by the demand of the user ministries of industry and they have a stake they pay for the satellites going up even if only in part and then once it becomes a line item in their ministries then they demand you know uh, why have you put the satellite up in time or is it working properly 
and you know, is there functionality and so on. So some amount of responsibility comes in that way, that kind of synergy is there. But you're right, I mean, this is the biggest challenge in all our functioning, um, breaking away from silos. Uh, I could go on and on about the many examples we're trying to do. Sure. And the principal scientific advisors uh, office, particularly in the areas of science and technology, is to work uh, to break these kinds of silos uh, across the ecosystems. And Thank that's you. something, again, which we're trying to do. Thank you. Now we have another 10 minutes and here's how we are going to do. Each of our speakers have one and a half minutes to set out your wish list of what you would like to see. It could be what you would like to see from citizenry, from private sector providers, uh, from government in the area of geospatial governance policy. So we will now start in the reverse order. So Mira, your one and a half minutes. So Hopefully, you know, uh, Dr. Vijay Raghavan will make some notes and maybe one or one and a quarter may get implemented. So it's just a wish list, positive, constructive wish list of what you would like to see change in the space that we are talking about. And it could be about any aspect that you feel relevant from your perspective. Meera, you go first. Thanks, Ravi. Um, first and foremost, I would like all governments, you know, center, state, at the city level as well to actually liberate data right there is uh, the guideline talks about um, geospatial data created with public money would be made accessible in a fair and transparent pricing manner i don't know what is fair and transparent i'm saying as civic groups as average citizens these are not startups you know trying to make money from an app we need access to data right it has to be opened up in fact now if you look at the kind of attention paid to india stack and like uh, you know some of these um, this, this is a kind of personal information. It's easier to access than information which is related to public goods, right? So I think we need more effort and attention paid to public information and something like a lake boundary or a you know city bus route. BMTC data is not still available in GTFS format. So the point is to open up that. So that is my first and foremost uh, you know requirement. Uh, the second thing is to also departments need to internalize open data and raw data, not just you know for example today in in data.gov there is a uh, data set submitted from Rajya Sabha saying number of highway projects by state. Why are we just talking about one little table? Why why aren't each of those projects actually mapped and uh, you know details of those projects provided so that's the kind of granularity is also important to understand and make sense of that information right and third and finally it is about collaborating with citizens there are enough people who care bangalore is a great example people want to contribute and make it a better city so work with citizens listen to citizens use uh, you know spatial data in public hearings and uh, hearings and interaction uh, if there's data missing people will are ready to help we can go collate it's very possible so want uh, would love for the government to actually reach out and actually work with the community Thanks, Thank Veera. You. Liberate data, see everything, put everything out spatially, and collaboration is the way forward. Nikhil, you go next. You're going in the reverse order of the speakers. Yeah. Perfectly all right. Last time when you allowed me to speak with a phrase saying animal unleashed, I actually took it literally. So uh, so coming coming back to that, uh, you know, your my wish list, I actually alluded to that already. The two parts. One is what is uh, that as an industry we should be doing. And to enhance the relevance, not only limited to disaster management, life saving, but also commercially, because then we have better, better audience and more voice and more impact we can make. So that's one. And uh, second, co-ownership and co-creation uh, with government in the national level platform. All these large government program where we, as a PPP, one of the things that I can tell you, which has spurred post 15th February, uh, is uh, yeah, uh, is Mira. Uh, it is opening up of a very old organization to 50 years old organization, Survey of India, opening its portal for everybody. That's a, that is, that's a big step. And that would not have happened had these guidelines not been made public. So that's, I don't like to see far more such things wherein we as Map My India engage, engages with the government for all the national level program, whether it is logistics platform, it is Jan Arogi Yojana, it is, uh, you know, portion of Yan, all these big, large programs, we can contribute a lot and a proper structuring in a PPP model. The modalities cannot be discussed here because that's a lot of nuances are there, but a step in that direction, uh, you know, encouraging the uh, private players to uh, play a big role in co-ownership and co-creation. Thank, thank you, Nikhil. So better PPP structuring as well as co-creation possibilities. 
Uh, Dr. Botale. Yeah, uh, good afternoon once again. Yeah, I think wish list is uh, uh, really a big one, but I will just try to converge on uh, one which is combination of all. So what I see, I uh, feel that what Mira ma'am was mentioning, I assume that data will be available because sir has taken so much big initiative and I am sure that it will be going in a big way. And uh, this, I don't see any issues in availability of the data in the current time, it will be definitely available. So with this availability of the data, I feel that uh, the technologies like digital twin, which is basically a common of geospatial technologies, internet of things, big data, artificial intelligence and machine learning, citizen science, and all together comes together, which solves the problem of near real time or real time decision making. Sir was mentioning about that government gets time of one week or uh, sometime. So essentially, if we want to make the uh, decision making faster, we need to not only bring the real world into the virtual, but also build the dynamics of that. Today, for example, a uh, grain is there in the uh, go down, unless whether that go down is having proper air conditioning, whether the environmental parameters are mentioned or uh, maintained or not, what is the condition of that? Everything has to be monitored along with that replica. So virtual world, creating a virtual world from the real world and putting all the dynamics parameters so that we get a real feel of whole uh, real, realism and give the solutions to the real world problems. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Botale. To yours, I would add one more wish list that there is increased use of evidence-based decision-making in everything that we do. So one would really like to also see, because once that happens, there'll be more hunger for data and putting it out there. I find Professor Gyas yeah, is not on the screen. In this yeah. case, uh, as of now, the although digital twin is the uh, much demand, but the plateau of productivity, what is told is something like five to 10 years. But I'm sure I think we will be able to make in five years with the young minds and uh, all co coming together, uh, government, private, academia. I think uh, everybody is, I think, in high spirits now. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Professor Vyas, your wish list, one and a half minutes. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Uh, now, first is, I, I think that we should have a very strong geospatial ecosystem. We need to have four dimensional strength to be improved with respect to education, industry, use of uh, geospatial data by stakeholders so that it repeatedly gets enhanced and upgraded, updated and upgraded, as well as we can have this uh, collaboration between industry, academia, as well as government. What I would like to uh, see is that revamping the geography subject in the uh, school level where uh, map making uh, can be changed or upgraded to preparation and understanding of the map where one can identify several aspects of the map. Then we, we need to look into few things. One is the form, formation of the research lab with geographically spreaded at multiple locations equipped with maps and data accessibility, directory of mentors and advisors, for the students to get uh, best uh, um, uh, uh, resources, compilation of best practices and success stories, sensitization and awareness workshops, appreciation matters and prices of encouraging uh, more students to learn geospatial technology. And ultimately the last thing is the stakeholders collaboration where I use a word say together. So together we work, together we achieve. And together we win. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Vyas. In addition to your geography suggestion, which I really liked, I think someday Raj Bhagat must tell us how he got, fell in love with mapping per se. Maybe it was in his geography class. Dr. Roy, uh, your wish list. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. I, I think many of my wish lists have been covered. So I will be direct on uh, what uh, has not been covered. Uh, urban sector and infrastructure development requires a measurement of the certain parameters. These measurements require a very a high resolution maps and also it needs a topographic correction. So at the moment, geospatial policy has addressed up to one meter resolution, but for detailed high granularity maps of urban sector, 
and also in the infrastructure development you need a scientifically and technically solid data and that should be acquisition of such data should be enabled at a uh, private sector through a regular uh, mechanism of uh, ensure that there is a safety of the data and also security uh, aspects so that aspect people people are using coarse resolution data for studies on urban and infrastructure analysis which is technically wrong thank you dr roy uh, uh, in bringing up the resolution the un thing uh, i am not going to give madhav raj and veena time because as wri they have huge access to government they will make their own case and we are exactly at 4 o'clock uh, so dr vijay raghavan any closing comments and then we are good to say thank you to everybody sir well um, thank you very much uh, i've been um, really this has been a learning experience right from citizen matters to technologies and remote sensing and i've learned a lot uh, all points are well taken and we'll do everything to uh, make data in a manner which is enabled for uh, access and citizens use and uh, please feel free to be in touch with me at any time and you know all of government all of our colleagues are there to make sure that the new geospatial rules the guidelines the drone policy are used for both economic and social well-being and as i highlighted uh, in the context of climate change and sustainable development in the best possible way thank you very much thank you uh, thank you everybody thank you to all the fellow panelists for hanging in here for all the two hours to all our attendees who have also been uh, with us for the last two hours thank you so much and all the best thank you so much thank you thank